interstate water disputes. My name is Leon Shaptitsky. I'm the uh, executive director of the Water in the West program, which is a joint program of the Lane Center for the American West and the Woods Institute for the Environment. It's a program that uh, fosters inter interdisciplinary research and engagement on Western water issues at Stanford. We're happy to have you all here. This is uh, also, I should say, part of our uh, uh, regular series of environmental forums at the Woods Institute. And we're having, since this is such a legally focused um, topic, we're having this one at the law school. So for those of you at the law school um, who are interested in these things, I would encourage you to look at the Woods Environmental Forum um, and see if there are any other topics uh, that interest you. Normally they're over at, um, normally they're over at Y2E2. And most of you have already discovered this, but we have uh, refreshments outside that um, uh, are primarily for uh, afterwards, although it's fine to eat them now. But there will be um, a short reception outside the classroom uh, after the presentation, so we uh, encourage you to stick around. Um, our plan today is to have our panelists each talk for about 15 minutes, maybe a little bit longer, and then have about half of our allotted time available for questions, and then have the reception afterwards. Um, and the reason we're doing this, it's, it's really a fortunate um, uh, uh, coincidence that we have three um, prominent experts in interstate water disputes at Stanford at the same time, um, and I'll, I'll explain uh, their role in that. So it's that, that was the um, reason for the panel, and as, as you'll soon hear, it's really a, a fortunate circumstance and with everybody, with uh, David and Burke and Buzz all here this quarter, it would have been impossible not to have this panel in some respects. So this is the order that we'll go in. Uh, uh, Buzz Thompson will go first. Buzz is the Paradise Professor of Natural Resources at Stanford Law School and the Perry L. McCarthy Director and Senior Fellow at the Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment. Most of you know this, but Buzz is one of the nation's leading experts in natural resources law generally, and water law in particular. He has published widely on both topics, including scholarly articles, textbooks, and publications for broader audiences. For purposes of this panel, the primary um, item on his uh, biography is that he's currently serving as special master for the United States Supreme Court in the ongoing dispute between Wyoming and Montana over the Yellowstone River Compact. Um, and Buzz will talk a little bit about uh, the background on interstate river disputes and compacts generally, the history of river compacts more specifically, and then talk a little bit about his experience as the special master for the Supreme Court um, with respect to the dispute over the Yellowstone Compact. So Buzz will go first, and then our second panelist is David Hayes. Uh, David is currently a visiting lecturer at Stanford Law School and a senior fellow at the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. It's hard to uh, capture all of David's biography in just a short um, introduction, but most saliently for today, he served two different stints at the Department of Interior, first under President Clinton um, and Secretary Bruce Babbitt from 1997 to 2001, first as counselor to the Secretary of Interior and then as Deputy Secretary of Interior, the number two job at the department. And his second stint was from 2009 to 2013 in the Obama administration under Secretary Salazar as Deputy Secretary of the Interior. Outside of his government service, uh, David uh, has uh, served in private practice with Latham and Watkins, and he's currently, in addition to his work at Stanford and the Hewlett Foundation, serving as the vice chair of President's Obama, President Obama's uh, advisory council on international wildlife trafficking. And David, in his, in his different stints at the Department of Interior, served as the federal government's point person on a number of extremely controversial uh, water disputes, including uh, the disputes over the Colorado River, um, uh, the Klamath and the uh, California Bay Delta, among others. Kind of a hit parade of water controversies. Uh, our, our last panelist will be Burke Griggs. Burke is uh, currently um, a consulting professor and visiting scholar at the Bill Lane Center for the American West. Uh, Burke's full-time job when he's not here at Stanford is a, as an assistant attorney general for the state of Kansas. He also serves as a lecturer at the University of Kansas Law School. Um, Burke represents and advises state agencies in Kansas on a variety of natural resources issues, but most importantly for today, he has extensive experience litigating interstate compacts, having represented the state of Kansas um, most recently in the dispute before the United States Supreme Court, um, dispute with Colorado and Nebraska over the waters of the Republican River. So we have uh, uh, both the judicial perspective with, uh, with Buzz, government perspective with David, and then a litigator's perspective with Burke. So it's really a, a, a perfect uh, circumstance. Burke is going to talk a little bit about how 
our increasing use of groundwater, which really began for irrigation, which really uh, picked up speed in the 1940s and 50s, is affecting interstate water disputes. And he'll also talk about his experiences uh, litigating the Republican River dispute before the Supreme Court. So uh, I'll let, just let Buzz kick it off. Thank you okay. all very much for being here. Uh, go ahead. OK. Uh, well, it's great to be here uh, talking about what I think is an incredibly important issue in the Western United States, and an issue which is going to become more and more important as time passes. As Leon mentioned earlier, my major role right now is as special master in the Montana versus Wyoming uh, case, which is a case dealing with uh, the Yellowstone uh, River system, which begins in Wyoming and then uh, defies gravity by flowing north into Montana and then into uh, uh, North Dakota. For those of you who are really interested in interstate uh, issues, the closing argument in, the, in this phase of the Montana versus Wyoming case is actually going to be here on the Stanford campus on Thursday, May 1st. Uh, we'll be beginning, I think, at 9 a.m. Uh, one of the advantages of being special master is I basically am able to hold any of the sessions of this case anywhere I want to. And having spent three months holding the trial in Billings, Montana in the fall, I told all the attorneys they had to come here to Stanford for the uh, closing arguments. Uh, so that will be on May 1st. It's open to the public. It will be in the moot courtroom uh, downstairs. And again, if you're interested, I encourage any of you who want to uh, to come for, uh, for that closing argument. Now, although my principal role right now in the interstate area is a special master in the Montana versus Wyoming case, what I want to use my 15 minutes to do is to provide a brief introduction uh, to the entire issue of division of interstate waters in the Western United States, and also to raise some, I think, very provocative and politically unrealistic ideas for where we might go in the future in trying to resolve uh, interstate disputes. Uh, but first of all, just a little bit of geography and history. This is a map of the major rivers in the contiguous uh, United States. And one of the things that you'll see here is that there are a lot of interstate rivers uh, in the United States. We didn't necessarily have to organize the United States in this particular fashion. Uh, but what we did was, number one, we frequently used rivers as borders between states. And of course, if you use a river as a border between two or more states, then you automatically have an interstate river. You have a river which uh, states are going to argue over. And then in addition to that, we also drew the uh, uh, western United States without caring in the least about anything in the way of actual physical demographics. Uh, so we just drew straight lines uh, across the uh, western United States, up and down. Uh, and that meant that, for example, the Colorado River, which is the major river in the southwest, uh, crosses seven states before it goes into, well, uh, into Mexico. Now again, even though this is the way things are organized, we could have done things in different ways. So John Wesley Powell, uh, who well, was the first European explorer of the Colorado River, traveled down the Grand Canyon uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the Colorado River, even though he had lost one of his arms in the uh, Civil War. Uh, Powell wrote a major report in the late 19th century on the arid lands of the western United States. And Powell's idea was that no matter how we might organize ourselves for other purposes, when it came to water and land use planning, the Western United States should be organized by watershed. And you can see on the left-hand side of the screen the picture that Powell put into his report on the arid west, which shows how he would have divided up the arid west, again, for purposes of water management and land use management, and it was by uh, watershed. If we had done uh, what Powell suggested, we wouldn't have ended up with the issue that we're faced with uh, today on this particular panel, or at least we wouldn't have faced it uh, in the Western United States. Uh, but Powell had two or three problems. Number one, he was uh, a great explorer. He actually, I think, had fantastic ideas about how to allocate water, but he was politically inept. 
uh, and basically alienated everybody in the United States Senate and the United States Congress that might otherwise have liked his particular ideas. Part of being politically inept was that he came out at a fairly early stage against any federal support of dams and reservoirs in the western United States, which meant he alienated every single western representative. And he was also a little bit late. Uh, by the time he came up with this particular idea, we had drawn most of our borders in the western United States, and states weren't interested in sharing any of their authority over water uh, with these uh, uh, basically uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, watershed basin uh, areas. That wasn't the only way we could have avoided the question, however, of divvying up uh, interstate uh, waters. Uh, William Velas, who is pictured here, was Secretary of the Interior during Grover Cleveland's uh, administration. And Velas's idea was that the federal government uh, should manage all of the waters in the western United States, and that if you wanted uh, a license to uh, take water out of the Columbia River or the Colorado River, then you would have to go to the federal government, and you would get your license from it. And so there was a major movement in the late 19th century to basically federalize uh, certainly the interstate rivers in the western United States and have the federal government uh, actually manage those waterways. Again, it probably would be a better approach than the approach that we have ended up with. Uh, but there was a serious question at that point in time as to whether or not the federal government constitutionally uh, could do that. Uh, and the major opponent of William B. Loss is Joseph Carey, who you see in the lower right-hand corner. He was a senator from uh, Wyoming, if I remember. Uh, and his idea was that it's the states that should divide up the, uh, uh, the water. Uh, and in fact, the battle between Velas and Kerry led to the Kerry Act, which provided that the states would try to develop water in the western United States, funded in part by federal lands that the states would get once they actually started distributing water uh, to areas of the uh, uh, federal public domain. So again, this idea of dividing up the West by watershed or just nationalizing the whole thing uh, didn't work. That leads us back into the problem of, well, how then do you divide up the water amongst the various states through which that water flows? And we've basically developed three different approaches to dividing up interstate waterways. The very first approach is what is known as equitable apportionment or judicial apportionment. And this solution says that if states can't agree how you divide up the water of a river, you go to the United States Supreme Court, and the United States Supreme Court then will decide how to allocate the water based on what they consider to be uh, fair and just uh, to the various states that are uh, before them. And the Supreme Court first came up with this concept in the Kansas versus Colorado case of 1907, dealing with the Arkansas uh, River uh, that Burke is actually going to talk about later because these proceedings can take forever. Uh, and so even though it first went to the United States Supreme Court in 1907, it is still before the United States Supreme Court in a case which uh, Burke will talk about uh, in a, a few moments. I don't think the US Supreme Court particularly likes these cases. Um, <laughs> They realize that they're very important. Uh, these are cases between sovereign uh, bodies. And there is no other court that can resolve these disputes because under the United States Constitution, cases between states fall within the original jurisdiction of the United States Supreme Court. So a federal district court or a state court uh, under our Constitution are not permitted to actually hear these types of disputes. So they have to go to the United States Supreme Court. And because they fall within the United States Supreme Court's original jurisdiction, it also means that they don't go to a trial court first. They go immediately uh, to the United States Supreme Court. And the way in which the United States Supreme Court resolves these cases is they appoint somebody like me to serve as a special master and then sit, take the uh, uh, evidence, issue a report to the U.S. Supreme Court, and then the U.S. Supreme Court ultimately uh, resolves them. Uh, but it's a clunky mechanism. Um, it deals with issues the United States Supreme Court doesn't feel uh, very comfortable with. And so one of the things the U.S. Supreme Court frequently does is that they duck 
uh, these cases, if they possibly can. And in the original Kansas versus Colorado case in 1907, after deciding that, in fact, they did have the authority to divide up the waters of interstate rivers in a way that was just and fair to all the various states involved, they then decided that the dispute between the two states at that point in time was not so serious that the Supreme Court really needed to hear it and told the states to go away uh, and to come back again at a later point in time when the dispute had become serious enough uh, to waste the Supreme Court's uh, time with. So the second idea uh, that the United States uh, began to, well, uh, to work with was the idea of getting the states together and having them negotiate an agreement for how they would divide up the waters uh, of an interstate river. And the very first river that we tried this with was the Colorado River in 1922. And what you see here is the Colorado River Compact Commission that was summoned in 1922 to try to come to an agreement for dividing up the waters of, of this river. Uh, and the chair of the commission is the uh, guy who's in the first row, third from the right. You should recognize him, Herbert Hoover. Herbert Hoover was Secretary of Commerce at this particular point in time, uh, and uh, President Harding asked him if he was willing to well, uh, convene everybody. Uh, they got together at the, uh, uh, at the Bishop's Lodge outside of Santa Fe, New Mexico. I don't know whether any of you have ever visited the Bishop's Lodge. It is a wonderful uh, resort. And if you're there, if you're there again, look uh, in the hallways and you'll find pictures of the uh, commissioners. Uh, when they were deliberating. Basically, Hoover locked them up uh, and told them that you know, they couldn't come out until they actually came up with an agreement. Even so, they couldn't figure out how to divide the water amongst all seven states. So what they did was they divided it between an upper basin and a lower basin, leaving it up to the states within each of those basins to try to come up uh, with a further allocation at a later point in time. The northern four basin states came to an agreement. The southern three could never, uh, on their own, uh, come to an agreement over how you allocate the waters. The guy who actually came up with this idea and really pushed the idea of compacts, though, is this guy, Delph Carpenter, who was from uh, Colorado. Uh, and he was the one that, at this point in time, really felt this was the way uh, to move forward. And over the next 40 years, you have a number of interstate river compacts that are negotiated uh, amongst the various states. The ones that are in italics involve Colorado. And I show this here only because you can see the influence of Delph Carpenter uh, in that, that period between 1922 and 1949. Virtually all of the rivers uh, were rivers that Colorado was, uh, uh, was involved in. The compact that I'm looking at right now is the Yellowstone uh, River Compact. The state's that uh, share the Yellowstone River system actually did come to an agreement uh, in 1950. But even though they came to an agreement in 1950, they've never uh, been able to actually come to an agreement over how you actually implement uh, that particular uh, compact. One of the things I should point out here is, is that Frequently, the federal government forced states uh, to, or nudged states into uh, agreeing to a compact because a lot of these various states wanted uh, federal money for projects on their rivers. And the federal government said, well, we'll give you the money, but only if you agree first as to how you're actually going to allocate the water because we don't want to give you money for a major water project and then find out that you're going to argue for the next 20 years over how you actually divide up the water. So again, my particular compact is the Yellowstone. Uh, during the questions and answers, I'd be happy to talk to you about the proceeding that's before me to the degree uh, that I am able. Uh, this is the Yellowstone uh, River system, um, and you'll see it actually involves a number of different rivers, Powder the Tongue, uh, the Bighorn, and the uh, uh, main stem of the Yellowstone River as they go over into uh, the other state. But again, these states, even though they came to an agreement, um, were not able to actually figure out how to implement it, ultimately had to sue uh, before the United States Supreme Court, which is another role for the United States Supreme Court now, which is actually uh, implementing uh, these compacts and telling the states what they actually agreed to. And here's my list of some of the problems uh, with compacts. Uh, so one problem is, is that they can take a long time to negotiate. 
Uh, in the case of the Yellowstone River Compact, it was 15 years uh, that it took uh, the states to actually come to an agreement uh, over how you were going to divide up the waters of the Yellowstone River. Frequently, the only way they come to an agreement is that they duck hard issues. So these compacts are littered with provisions that say, we're not dealing with Indian water rights. We're not dealing with water quality. All of them, or virtually all of them, are silent on groundwater issues. Anything tough, they sort of put to the side. And on the other issues, they are sometimes silent. As I mentioned a moment, virtually none of them mention groundwater. They can be vague and ambiguous because one of the easiest ways of actually bridging differences of opinion is to be really vague about what you're agreeing to. Uh, or they can be internally inconsistent. As one state says, I want this provision. Another state says they want that provision. And you just put both of the two provisions uh, into the compact. And then a final thing, which I think very important moving forward, is they're very inflexible. So David will probably talk a little bit about the Colorado River Compact later. It basically divides up the water of the river by set amounts totaling 16 million acre feet of water. And on average, the river doesn't have 16 million acre feet of water, and it will have less in the future. And so it's a system that begins to break down uh, when you see changing conditions. Because of the difficulties of negotiating these compacts, you also find that although we had good success in the early years negotiating compacts, more recently we've had a tough time. The blue shows new compacts, the red shows amendments uh, to compacts. You'll see that the last compact we actually negotiated was in 1978 over the Red River, and the last time we had an amendment to a contract was uh, to a compact was in 1992 on the Sabine River. So for the last 22 years, We've had no changes to compacts or any new compact. So this brings us to Arizona versus California, which probably David will mention again in a few moments. In Arizona versus California, Arizona and California were arguing over the amount of water allocated to the lower basin in, by the Colorado River Compact. It went to the United States Supreme Court for a judicial apportionment, for one of these equitable apportionments of the water between the two states. And as is frequently the case, the Supreme Court ducked that by saying that Congress had actually already divided up the waters of uh, the lower basin and that they had put the uh, Secretary of Interior uh, in charge of what to do during periods of drought. I think most people believe that the United States Supreme Court was totally wrong on that. Congress had never intended that. It actually, I think, was a brilliant solution. Um, but the Supreme Court really did it because they didn't want to have to get into the business of telling each state what they thought they should get. Instead, it was a lot easier to say, we're not doing this. Congress already actually imposed this particular uh, solution on us. A lot of people thought after Arizona versus California that the F Congress might actually step in and start apportioning uh, water. That gets us to our third solution. But in fact, the only clear example where Congress has ever done that is over the waters of the Truckee and Carson uh, rivers, uh, where Congress actually adopting an agreement that had already been entered into by California and Nevada, uh, apportion the waters of those particular rivers. I think that's the only example where Congress has ever stepped in here. Uh, and just sort of skipping that uh, uh, slide, I think the reason is, if you're a member of Congress, the last thing you want to do is to get in the middle of an interstate water dispute. Uh, and tell some of your fellow senators how much water their state uh, is going to get. Because number one, not only don't you really want to have to deal with that, but furthermore, if you tell the senator for Arizona how much water they're going to get, they're in the future going to tell you how much water you're going to get from your interstate uh, river. There is still, though, I think a very important role, I'll be interested in David's thoughts on this, to federal nudging, to the federal government actually nudging the parties. Uh, towards an agreement over interstate waters because as you can tell none of the approaches that we have for dividing up interstate waters work very well. But what I want to very quickly suggest are three other potential roles for the federal government and I'll give them each a name. One is you can imagine the federal government playing a role as an empowering river coach. Uh, and here it's basically sort of uh, nudging on steroids. Uh, the federal government really gets in there through a variety of mechanisms 
and really pushes the states forward on coming to agreements and more importantly binds the federal government to agreeing to whatever that allocation is because frequently that allocation has ramifications for federal agencies um, and so without the federal government's approval and active participation it can sometimes be difficult to allocate these rivers. A little bit more controversial would be, could you imagine the federal government through the Congress creating an interstate water adjudication board? In a lot of states, we have agencies which adjudicate the waters of a river. So could you imagine the Department of the Interior would have an interstate water adjudication board uh, that when the states couldn't agree, Rather than it going to the Supreme Court, it would go to this adjudication board that would actually figure out how best to allocate the rivers. Maybe the Supreme Court finally signs off on it at the end, but the federal government would play this role. And I've also thrown in here the idea of water bankruptcy. If you have a compact that isn't working because there's not enough water anymore because maybe of climate change, then you can declare the compact bankrupt and the federal government sort of renegotiates it like a bankruptcy uh, judge to fit the water that's available. And if that's not controversial enough, I like the idea of independent river operators. In the energy field, we have independent system operators that figure out how you actually allocate all the energy in order to meet all the demands. Here the idea would be maybe we create independent river operators at the national level uh, that would divide up all the water. Um, the problem with all of these, though, is that you have to get through Congress. Um, <laughs> this is actually a picture of the California State Legislature uh, last year. Um, but I think it symbolizes the problem of coming up with any new solution today, which is actually getting the politicians uh, to do anything. And I'll end with these pictures of some sophomores that I and David Kennedy uh, took down the Colorado River a couple of years ago, and this is them looking out over the Colorado River. Uh, and these guys are filled with optimism, and so I just wanted to leave you with that because we need people filled with optimism to figure out how we're going to deal with these interstate water allocation issues in the future. Thank so. you, Buzz. So, David, you're next. I, I, I don't think you realized you were going to have to talk about what the appropriate coaching style was for the federal government, whether it's sort of <laughs> positive and encouraging or more sort of the Bobby Knight tough love style. But. <laughs> We'll turn that over to you. I, I just find it uh, amusing that a former Supreme Court law clerk and a current uh, uh, water master appointed by the Supreme Court uh, who uh, commented correctly, I think the Supreme Court was trying to duck water issues in the past, is now trying to push everything off to the federal government or an independent <laughs> operator or anybody but me or us or whatever. So... I think I've got a presentation if we can uh, go oh, up. It's the very next to, one. I think I might just. Okay. No? Okay. No. No, I'll just wait for Janet. Yeah. yeah. Are they all loaded, Syriana? No. So uh, thankfully, the title of the program is not just interstate compacts, but also transboundary river management issues. Um, uh, because interestingly, and I think, I think Buzz's slide was very relevant here, you could see that the interstate compact trend has petered out. Uh, and, and I think it's for several reasons. Uh, the traditional compact, as Buzz was explaining, really deals with allocation issues, who gets how much water. Uh, today's water management issues are typically much more complex uh, than the question of which state or which party gets how many acre feet of water. You're dealing now with issues uh, such as um, how are you managing your water to deal with endangered species and how much water is needed uh, for that upstream, downstream, regardless of state. You're, you're dealing uh, with uh, uh, issues uh, like Indian water rights uh, where uh, you have uh, unexercised pri high priority water rights by uh, by tribes and how that fits in or not uh, to the way water has been allocated. Uh, you've got storage issues uh, potentially that that are they were completely uh, unanticipated, uh, uh, arguably at the time that some of these compacts were entered into. And I think what you're finding is that the states are not turning to compacts very much anymore to resolve these issues. Um, 
they're turning to other uh, mechanisms. And, and I just want to illustrate uh, some of that with a couple of examples uh, here. So I'm going to talk first uh, and mainly about the Klamath River Basin and the Colorado River Basin. And then I'm going to tease you a little bit with something about the Bay Delta that is in the news here. That'll be for the next Water in the West program. Uh, right, uh, yeah, Leon? Yeah. So uh, the Klamath is a very interesting interstate system um, that begins up in, in Oregon, as you can see, um, and, uh, and then crosses the California line, goes down a very beautiful, uh, narrow canyon, uh, and then uh, uh, the, the, the Trinity River is the main trip tributary. You can see that coming in, and then the lower Klamath widens out. Many of you have crossed the Klamath on your way up uh, north, uh, right uh, at the mouth there on the Pacific. Uh, traditionally, the Klamath was one of the most productive salmon streams um, on the West Coast, uh, and uh, the Trinity is a, is a major tributary, and that was a major uh, salmon stream uh, as well. Uh, but, but then things started happening, uh, and the uh, U.S. Congress uh, in 1905, only three years after the Reclamation Law of 1902 was passed, established a reclamation project in the Klamath Valley. Uh, that would be in Oregon, uh, upstream here, uh, uh, just south of, of the upper Klamath Lake, and that whole region is a reclamation project. Now, this was part of the Western expansion. The reclamation concept was to develop water projects to facilitate irrigation water for farmers. And, and this, this area became a very large early uh, reclamation uh, project. Uh, then uh, uh, you also had the march of dams uh, coming up the Klamath River. And beginning in 1905 and as late as 1962, you had a series of dams uh, on the California side primarily marching up the river uh, to producing hydropower. Uh, the, the current owner of those dams is Pacific Corps, which is a subsidiary of, of MidAmerican, which is a Warren Buffett back, uh, Berkshire Hathaway company. Um, you had, interestingly, a 1956 interstate compact, which I had no idea. I'd worked on the Klamath. I had no idea there was an interstate commerce until uh, compact until I saw Buzz's slide that said 1956 Klamath. I went, Whoa, I better check into this. I'm about to speak about this uh, compact. Well, it's very interesting, actually, how this happened. And, and it, it, it conveniently proves my point that compacts aren't that important in many contexts. Uh, so the compact was in 1956. Here's what happened in 1955. Now, you, you see the, um, the tributary of the, the Trinity River there that, that uh, goes kind of south and then east. In 1955, um, the U.S. Congress um, uh, established, uh, realized that the Central Valley of California needed even more water uh, than, it, than it was getting from the, the, the construction of the Shasta Dam and the, the, uh, the, the, the Federal Water Project in the Central Valley. And it uh, had a water project that built a tunnel through the mountains and took 90% of the flow of the Trinity River and shot it into the Central Valley. And the folks in Oregon were really scared. Uh, these Californians, where would they stop? And so that is why in 1956, there's an interstate compact. What did the compact do? It, it affirmed the upper basin water rights. California, keep your mitts off. The, what's left up here was staying up here, all right? You've taken all the water down there, no more. Uh, very interesting. Uh, also, there's, a, there's another interesting chapter to the Trinity Riverside. Uh, uh, the, uh, in 2000, there was a decision made by the uh, Clinton administration that I was involved in to, that the original act that moved the water from the Trinity over to the Central Valley anticipated that there would be no impact on fish. Well, surprisingly, maybe not so surprisingly, there were some impacts on fish. Uh, and so a lot of the water has been returned, and there's a big restoration effort in the Trinity. OK, so another few facts here. Uh, and this gets to the point of, of what's really happening in a lot of these interstate river systems is, is again, not just a water quantification issue. You have the listing of, of uh, two different types of endangered species. You have the coho salmon, who um, 
have, are having a lot of trouble uh, getting over the dams up uh, to their traditional habitat. They can't. They're completely blocked. Um, there are salmon uh, south of the most southerly dam and then going into the Trinity, so it's still an important area. Uh, and now with the Trinity coming back, it's even more important, uh, but you, you have blockage there. And then, interestingly, in the upper Klamath Lake, you have some local indigenous fish who are endangered as well because the reclamation project demands have not been consistent with the, the spawning needs uh, of those suckers. Um, suckers is the traditional name, not... <laughs> Um, not an epithet. Not an epithet, <laughs> correct. <laughs> um, these, uh, these endangered species issues boiled up, uh, and you may remember this, uh, in the early 2000s. There were, there were biological opinions by the National Marine Fisheries Service for salmon and by the Fish and Wildlife Service for the uh, upper basin uh, fish that established minimum flows down the river for the salmon and also minimum lake levels uh, for the, 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 the species of fish uh, in, the, in the lake. Uh, and in, 19, in 2001, uh, the Bush administration, in came Secretary Gail Norton, uh, and it was a terrible drought, and the, these, these requirements could not be met. The only way to meet, keep the minimum lake level was to essentially um, uh, stop uh, the, the, the deliveries to the irrigators. And you may remember there was violence. It was, it was a really ugly situation, not unlike Clive Bundy last, week in, uh, last weekend in Nevada. Um, and they, they ultimately uh, uh, put it to the National Academy of Sciences for a review, big controversy. Um, the decision was made by the Bush administration not to do that again. Uh, and the next year, uh, they, they let the water uh, flow and there was a huge fish kill in the, in the lower Klamath because not enough water was going downstream. They essentially took care of the farmers upstream, fish kill downstream. Um, meanwhile, you have the dam owner, uh, the Pacific Corps, dealing with a relicensing process for the, the dams under the Federal uh, Energy Regulatory Commission and needing to come up with a, it, typically you, you get a license for 50 years for these dams and then the 50 year mark, you, you need to meet modern requirements for dam management, including fish, fish passage. So the question was, uh, how are you going to get around these dams? These are, it's a narrow canyon, large dams, really challenging to get the fish up. Maybe they should be removed. So big controversy there as well. And then the, the latest bit of seismic activity in the basin uh, happened last year, uh, also a very bad water year. And, and the Klamath tribe, which has uh, high priority water rights in the upper basin above the upper Klamath Lake, um, put a call in uh, on, on water. Again, very, very little water is available. It said, we have the best water rights and we have the right to have a priority over the other water users in the area. The Department of the Interior, we supported that. And in fact, that was confirmed by a court. And that was uh, really a seismic uh, event up there. All of a sudden, the, the water users above Upper uh, Klamath Lake were saying, whoa, this is not good. In a, in a drought, we don't know if we'll, we'll ever get our water. So how are these issues starting to get sorted out? Um, this is today's uh, answer to the traditional interstate commerce, I would argue. There are three agreements in play. Very interesting. First uh, is the Klamath Basin Restoration Agreement, which was signed in 2010. And the issue there it primarily uh, focuses um, on the, the conflict between uh, the, the farmers uh, in the reclamation project and their uh, need to get water and some of the tribes right in that region, um, and also the downstream water use, water users. It's an attempt to actually negotiate what the biops did in the early 2000s, which was establish minimum flows for downstream and minimum water to maintain in the, uh, in the valley. Forty parties, 40 parties got together and negotiated this. Uh, it would also fund some ecosystem restoration project and, and, as I mentioned before, resolve some tribal 
and, and Bureau of Reclamation water uh, disputes. As a sort of corollary to that was a Klamath hydroelectric settlement agreement that would evaluate and, uh, the potential removal of four hydroelectric dams. Essentially, Pacific Corps is saying this, the economics really are not that good for us for these dams anymore. The potential investment to have fish passage is too significant. We're not doing, we're, we're willing to take these dams out. And EIS has been completed. Uh, it would open up 420 miles of salmon habitat. It'd be fantastic. Congressional authorization is needed. There'd be a cost share, and here's where the state of California comes in. Those dams are mostly in California. Um, Pacific Corps said we'll put $200 million toward taking down the dams if California uh, uh, raises the rest uh, by the state legislature. That's part of, the, part of the understanding. And this looked like it was going to go through, this whole package of, of arrangements. The, the dams coming out would cost about a billion dollars. Uh, the rest of the cost for restoration, et cetera, we're talking about half a billion dollars. Now, most of the billion is not part of this deal and would not require um, uh, uh, Congress. It would be the state of California and, and, the, uh, um, uh, the, and Pacific Corps. But there was a concern that in the upper basin, again, this starts with the reclamation project in south, those water users up top were, didn't like this idea and had stalled this all out in Congress. But then last year, there's a, there's, there's a seismic activity in the upper basin with the Indians claim, and whoa, they got something to lose too or to gain by an agreement. So tomorrow, tomorrow, this, we, we time this very well, uh, the upper Klamath Basin Comprehensive Settlement Agreement is being signed. Uh, and, and it is a response to that, that tribal water call last year and it would, it would settle, uh, it would create a water use program in the above Klamath Lake to settle out how much water could, would be coming down. And essentially, uh, the, the tribes have, have provided an agreement that during drought, they would share uh, their, their high priority water with non-Indian water users. And there'd also be some economic development uh, money for the, for the Klamath tribe and a riparian program. So we now have three agreements on the table that potentially <clears throat> solve the whole raft of problems that have essentially nothing to do with interstate allocation, but all are, but are very much about an interstate agreement. There, there would have to be an agreement by the, uh, by the state of, of Oregon, by the state of, of California, and by the United States Congress, so it looks and feels like an inter, a modern day interstate compact. The, the cost to the Congress would be about half a billion dollars. I mentioned the other billion dollars for taking it on the dams to be shared by Pacific Corps and, um, uh, and the state of California. Question is, can Congress do it? Can Congress do anything uh, these days? Uh, particularly when you're talking about taking down dams uh, and, and uh, there are some folks philosophically uh, opposed to that. Uh, but you have every, well, you don't have everyone in the basin agreeing to it. You've got a couple of counties that are unhappy with it. So there quickly, I'm gonna to move to the Colorado River. Uh, this is the big kahuna uh, of interstate uh, waterways as, as Buzz alluded to. It's the big kahuna because it is the most important waterway in the Southwest, arguably in the country. For those of you who have been on the Colorado and have seen the Mississippi and the Columbia, you go, uh, you go wh why is this? Why? Uh, surely there's more to it than this. <laughs> but in fact, uh, it, it serves water to 40, 40 million Americans uh, and provides, uh, that's, that's municipal water, and then it, it, it irrigates uh, the, uh, much of, the, of uh, uh, Arizona and, and Southern California. Uh, just a couple of real quick points here, because we could talk forever. Uh, Buzz gave you some of the key facts. The Colorado River Compact in 1922 split the upper basin and the lower basin states, uh, 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 assigning an allocation to each of them that was above, in fact, the capability of the Colorado River, even pre-climate change impacts. Uh, there then followed a, an agreement in California to divvy up the California share of 4.4 million acre feet. Those of you who are interested in modern day water issues may be interested to find out that 3.85 million of those 4.4 million acre feet of Colorado, of California water rights 
on the Colorado River go to ag, the ag communities uh, in the eastern Colorado desert. The uh, Imperial Irrigation District, the Coachella Valley Irrigation Di District, the Palo Verde uh, Irrigation District, uh, so Metropolitan Water District of Southern California gets 500,000 uh, acre feet. The, the uh, farmers get 3.85 million. A little commentary on the times. Uh, um, and then there was a Mexico treaty. Uh, an additional 1.5 million acre feet of the Colorado was guaranteed to Mexico, uh, where the Colorado historically has flowed and historically flowed into the uh, Sea of Cortez. Uh, Buzz mentioned the Arizona uh, v. United States, which established the, the feds and the Secretary of the Interior as a water master. Very quickly here, um, this gives a little sense of, again, the, the way uh, interstate water issues have evolved from state-to-state state state allocation issues to a much more complex scenario here. The feds have a big issue, a big role, because uh, here, Arizona v. California, the Secretary of the Interior is the water master. But also, probably just as importantly, um, you have Hoover Dam, uh, you have Glen Canyon Dam, a huge reclamation, federal uh, 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 projects, uh, leading to the possibility for storage uh, that uh, was inconceivable early on that, there, that Nevada or California might want to store water in, uh, uh, in, in Lake Mead or, or Lake Powell, or even in the groundwater basin in Arizona uh, that has now been opened up by the Central Arizona Project. In fact, all of that is happening now. And the, the, the agreements, interstate agreements to store water uh, have been done by the Secretary of the Interior and could not have been imagined uh, under the Colorado uh, Compact. You also have modern reservoir operations needing to be essentially accepted by the, the water users. And that includes the pulse flows that we're seeing out of Glen Canyon Dam to help re resuscitate the beaches uh, through the, uh, through the Grand Canyon. And you've got the Endangered Species Act again and tribal water rights uh, playing a big role. Uh, the Arizona Water Settlement Act that finally was enacted by Congress in 2004 allocated the Gila River Indian community's water rights, which alone, uh, if fully adjudicated, arguably would have taken the entire flow of the Central Arizona project. And that was great leverage, and with that leverage, uh, we worked in the, in the Clinton administration to get a deal for the Gila River Indian, Indian community and many other tribes in Arizona that gave them the water rights that they never got out of the uh, Colorado Compact. Uh, and, and then the, the Mexico issue is very interesting as well. Minute 319 was, uh, 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 was concluded uh, a year ago last fall, addressing for the first time the 1.5 million acre feet uh, of, to Mexico in terms of what happens when there's a drought there's a five-year experimental deal that has uh, surplus water to Mexico being stored on, for Mexico's behalf in the American reservoirs. Very cool stuff. And then, as Buzz is, knows very well, uh, pulse flows into the Mexican Delta, which, which used to be a wonderful ecosystem and has fallen on hard times, to say the least, uh, is now potentially coming back. Uh, and there's some water coming back. <laughs> Um, there's a California connection. I'm going to wrap up here. Uh, interesting, and this, this illustrates also, I think, the federal nudging concept that Buzz was talking about. So you have, in theory, the Secretary of the Interior as the water master of the Colorado River and the seven states presumably waiting for direction from the Secretary of the Interior. That's not how it works. Uh, these seven states are all um, uh, uh, difficult. Uh, and. <laughs> Uh, and, and there has to be, in fact, an ongoing negotiation. And very interestingly, in the 1990s, um, California was taking more than its share of Colorado River water. Uh, and and uh, Bruce Babbitt, who was a master of this stuff, having been the former governor of Arizona, and who adopted the notion that not one extra drop of Arizona water should ever get to California, uh, recognized this as an issue and started essentially talking California down from what had been 4.8, 4.9 million acre feet. It led to the California 4.4 plan, uh, where California over time would, would come down to that 4.4 level and, and do a couple of important things along the way, move a lot of the, move 
up to 800,000 acre feet of water that was in the Imperial Irrigation District, have modern conservation for it, and move it to San Diego for urban use. And this is a ag to urban transfer that was all facilitated by this interstate uh, context and the kind of thing we're going to see more and more of. Uh, interestingly, and here's the final tease, uh, the, 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 the Southern California had been getting addicted to the fat to more than 4.4 million acre feet from the Colorado River, which is exactly why the upper basin states in particular were saying, whoa, you know, stop that. We don't want you to get addicted because, you know, we won't, we won't be able to get our water then. Because they were relying on more water from the Colorado and had to, to scale back on that, they became more reliant on water from uh, the Bay Delta. And, and this is the California <laughs> water system. Um, very big picture, final 30 seconds. One third of the water supply for Southern California, the 19 million people in Southern California, about one third of the water supply comes from the Colorado River. About one third is indigenous and fully one third comes from Northern California where two thirds of the state's water falls as rain or snow up that's above the Bay Delta. And it's pumped through the Bay Delta into uh, the canals down all the way to the 19 million customers in Southern California. As, the, as, as, the, as California had to cut back on Colorado River water, it's become even more reliant on bringing water through the Delta. And, and it, the, the world's largest water pumps pump that water through the Delta, except when they don't. Uh, because of salmon and because of other local fish impacts. And that's what's got everybody concerned. Uh, the, the water system in California is not sustainable right now, either for liability or for environmental uh, issues. And that's the next water presentation that we'll do some other time. Thank you. I, I just said that next one is, is going to be scheduled for about two weeks. That, that discussion will take at least two weeks. So you have to bring your own food and, um, and your own water and sleeping bag, and then we'll talk about uh, solving those problems. Burke? Sure. Can you load me up? and I'll. Uh, while that's happening, I'm very honored to be here. Uh, Buzz has focused on the Colorado and the Yellowstone. Uh, David is focused on the Klamath and the Bay Delta. Uh, I'm going to focus on a very different place, a place that most of you have probably not been to, the Great Plains of the Interior. Um, I was a college freshman here at Stanford in 1986 on the crew team. We were going out to the boathouse, and I introduced myself to the coxswain that year who grew up in Marin County. He said, where are you from? I said, I'm from Colorado. He said, oh, back east. <laughs> now, I, I took great offense at this. Um, <laughs> So I guess you can call me someone who's from back east. But uh, what I'd like to do today is uh, talk about uh, this, uh, this very different place. And let me go a little quickly through some of the cover, some of what, uh, what Buzz covered. We start off with this beautiful idea called the equal footing doctrine. Uh, that the states, when they become states, are equal to each other. And some say, the nine lawyers in D.C. actually have said this, that this applies to water as well. And this is my favorite quote from Justice Scalia. I don't know what it means. Uh, it's water appropriate. Life is a fountain. <laughs> um, so there's this equal footing doctrine, which is great. But the equal footing doctrine doesn't really help many states. This is a watershed map. It's not as good as buzzes. It's more modern. This is perhaps what it could look like. This is the Kansas-Nebraska Act, 1854. Now look what Kansas got and look what Nebraska got. Okay, Kansas got all the way to the eastern slope of Colorado, there's Long's Peak right about there, and cut off here in New Mexico, uh, New Mexico territory. Nebraska had everything along the Continental Divide uh, up to Canada. That's not Kansas's fault. Uh, what happened next is Kansas's fault. In uh, 1859, a group of Nebraskans came to the Kansas Constitutional Convention, and they came up with what's easily the most enlightened water policy idea in Nebraska history. They said the natural boundary of Kansas and Nebraska is the Platte River. So we should grant this territory to you, Kansas, 
And not for the first time, Kansas made a boneheaded political decision and said no to this. Uh, in 1861, because uh, the, the mines of Colorado uh, were too far away, uh, the uh, territorial legislature of Kansas granted away the western half of the territory. So, but for those two tragic events, I would not even be here today. Uh, there would be dozens of lawyers and hundreds of experts occupied doing something else. So this builds on uh, Buzz's points about uh, the, these original inequalities, and I really want to stress that. And, and what, what, what uh, added to that is that under the equitable apportionment doctrine that Buzz discussed, a lot of it had to do with which states had developed water uh, to a higher extent. And because of early settlement patterns favoring Colorado and the gold rush, uh, as opposed to western Kansas, more water effectively did get allocated under the Arkansas River <clears throat> uh, uh, to Colorado than it did to Kansas. And I have to say that in Kansas, you're supposed to pronounce this river Arkansas. Uh, and this fight between Kansas and Colorado has entered its second, possibly third century. And we have transcripts from Supreme Court hearings where the Council for Colorado and the Council for Kansas get into an argument over the proper pronunciation of the river they're fighting over. And you wonder why the Supreme Court doesn't like these cases. <clears throat> so what you have is before you have any interstate lawsuit or inter any interstate compact, you have a real fact of interstate inequality. You have a doctrine of equality, the equal footing doctrine, at odds in reality with inequality. And this, this leads us to the Arkansas or the Arkansas River. It's a beautiful river. This is near its headwaters, uh, probably in uh, Park County or Lake County. That's Mount Shivano, uh, 14er. Uh, downstream is not looking so good because here, between the headwaters, right up here, in the city of Pueblo, a lot of this was developed into irrigation. This is an old map from one of the original lawsuits at the turn of the 20th century. As a result, this is what the river often looks like in western Kansas. Uh, so this is the sort of problem you're dealing with. And it was chronic. It went on from the 1880s through uh, two interstate lawsuits between Kansas and Colorado on the Ark that Buzz mentioned. In both cases, the court ducked it. They said, we have the power to equitably apportion. But we're not going to. Once in 1907, another time in the 1940s. There's a very interesting reason why they ducked it. And I'll come back to this when I talk about groundwater. They, uh, Colorado made a convincing enough showing that they had developed so much water from the river and other rivers into irrigation systems that the return flows, taking the excess water off of the farms, back into the river actually benefited Kansas. That they had so developed the river that Kansas was a beneficiary. Um, this could not have been an easy lump for Kansas to take, that they're developing so much water that we're actually benefiting. Um, fast forward to the Dust Bowl and the Great Depression, and you have a new federal involvement in water in the Midwest. Uh, it had to do with the fact that the states realized after the Dust Bowl, after some incredibly debilitating floods in the 1930s, and the conservation practices such as they were of the Dust Bowl, which is where a lot of open uh, fields, uh, huge erosion problems, they needed federal assistance. And so the states combined to come to the United States uh, in the 30s to try and secure federal support for water especially water infrastructure. They could not afford to build dams and irrigation projects themselves. And this led to a much greater federal presence in the, the Great Plains area. And the Republican River Compact uh, is a good example uh, of this, this era of the, the federal government coming into this part of the country. What they did is they built a series of reservoirs and irrigation districts across uh, this basin, this basin is basically between the Platte and the Arkansas, okay? And most of these districts were in Nebraska, but some important ones were in Kansas. Uh, no districts were ever built in Colorado. So the Republican River 
compact in the basin shows the interplay of at least three federal statutory regimes. You have the Reclamation Act of 1902, you have the Flood Control Act of 1944, and then you have the compact, uh, which attempts to mediate among three very, very different states when it comes to how they deal with water. So by the 1950s, uh, as Buzz said, we appear to be on our way to some sort of progress. We have compacts, we have federal assistance, we're building reservoirs. Uh, we have, uh, in other words, peace in our time. Okay, this is not Gulf Carpenter, of course, that's someone else. Uh, why did Neville Chamberlain sign away uh, Central Europe to Hitler? He didn't have an army, he, didn't, he had an arm, it was 1938. Sort of the same problem. Uh, with a lot of the downstream states. They had not developed their water resources to the same extent. So just as in war, technological revolutions uh, can render war fighting obsolete, this is John Browning and his water-cooled machine gun, uh, the same thing can happen with water. This is Frank Zyback, uh, his field near Strasburg, Colorado, uh, in the, one of the first early center pivot irrigation systems using internal combustion and diesel power. You could pull water from deep in the ground and actually economically irrigate with it. So this produces the groundwater revolution. And groundwater is different. That's a very obvious statement. It's different than surface water. But it's different in hydrology. When you pump water out of the ground, you're going to be depleting nearby streams and rivers. You're also going to be de depleting the aquifer itself. And it's only a matter of time between when that pumping shows up in an effect at the river. It's called a lagged effect or lag depletions. We are pumping now uh, across the Ogallala uh, in ways that will not manifest themselves at the st local stream for decades, uh, but they will manifest themselves. It's also different in politics and in culture and in law because some states regulate groundwater the same way they regulate surface water. Kansas is one of those states. Other states don't. Nebraska does not really regulate groundwater. It does regulate surface water. Nebraska's water regime is pretty similar to Californians. Uh, Nebraska modeled its, its legal, its water law on Californians for better and for worse. Colorado is somewhere in the middle. Uh, so the groundwater revolution, as Buzz pointed out, causes big problems because these compacts don't mention groundwater. The states themselves then face a choice. If you are overpumping groundwater in such a way that it's reducing stream flows and making your state fall out of compliance with an interstate compact, you can reduce your pumping, restore the river, comply with the compact, or you can keep pumping, and when the ratio to groundwater and surface water in this part of the world is about seven to one, you have political interests invested in pumping groundwater. Irrigation creates more money uh, in terms of revenue than dry land farming. Politically, it's not a difficult choice. You pump and you take the risk over whether to sue or not. This is actually the Nebraska stamp. Um, you go with groundwater. Nebraska used to be the second largest groundwater pumper in the country. Uh, it's now the largest, not because it's pumping more, but because there have been restrictions in California uh, with the Bay Delta and other things to reduce pumping uh, in, uh, in this state. <clears throat> so this leads me to what I'd like to finish up with, uh, the second uh, half of my talk, really, which is litigating uh, this revolution in groundwater. Um, the first... Uh, Landmark case in groundwater was Texas v. New Mexico. I'm not really going to discuss it. Uh, it's an epic case. Uh, there's a great book about it called High and Dry by G. Emlyn Hall. Um, and he, like me, represented the state engineer at the state level and then represented Kansas at the interstate level. So I feel like he's been reading my mail when I read this book. You have engineers who are sure of the world and, you know, screw that judge. You know, I know what I'm going to do. It's like, no, you know, you talk about talking California down from a crazy place. Oftentimes you have to talk your client down uh, from a crazy place. <clears throat> but the, the, the big case for Kansas, uh, the first big one, was, was Kansas v. Colorado on the, on the Ark River. 
And it had to do with groundwater pumping on the arc that was depleting flows. And Colorado had actually, the state engineer of Colorado had made efforts to reduce pumping in the Pueblo to state line reach. But the Colorado Supreme Court had repeatedly ruled that he doesn't have the authority to do that. So Kansas filed suit in 1985. The trial took 270 days of trial. Um, the lead Kansas technical witness broke down on the stand and was taken to an institution after that. Um, he has not recovered. Uh, there were changes in legal uh, leadership uh, in the case. It was an epic and some could argue Pyrrhic victory for both sides. Uh, Kansas got $36 million in damages the first time you'd ever had actual money damages in a case. But Colorado limited that damage um, to 1968 and forward. It could have gone all the way back to 1880, 1890. Okay, so uh, both both sides uh, produced historic results. But what the what the case really did is it led to about a 50 percent reduction in groundwater pumping on this stretch of the river. The case I'm involved with, at least its second version, is. Kansas versus Nebraska on this Republican River. Now, Colorado is part of this lawsuit because they are, uh, they share part of the basin, but they are not uh, a, uh, we're not seeking any uh, remedies against them. This is the basic story. Colorado and Kansas, because they do and can regulate groundwater pumping, saw a problem in increased groundwater development. And you can see around 19, uh, 79 or so, both states put a moratorium on groundwater pumping. Nebraska did not. This does not mean Nebraska is somehow, you know, hellishly horrible compared to Colorado and Kansas. It's that they just have a different legal system. This gets back to my point about it, you know, the, the problem of legal diversity at state law manifesting itself at the, at the interstate level. When you overpump groundwater, surprise, surprise, inflows into reservoirs decrease. Uh, cause and effect. This is the main reservoir that, uh, that Kansas depends upon. Uh, Kansas sued in 1998, and one of the things Buzz didn't mention is, unlike most lawsuits, uh, when you sue in the original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, they don't have to accept your case. You have to convince the court that it is of sufficient dignity and seriousness that they will accept it. And so your first hurdle to clear is to get the case uh, accepted. The court accepted it. The central issue in this case was, as Buzz pointed out, does the compact mention groundwater? And the special master ruled that it does to the extent that groundwater pumping affects surface flows. So said so to the extent that uh, pumping groundwater shows up and manifests itself hydrologically in the Republican River Basin, the compact does incorporate that uh, groundwater. It does not necessarily incorporate groundwater that is hydrologically too distant from the river, such as deep Ogallala or Dakota aquifer formations. So, special master made this ruling. After this threshold ruling, the parties settled. The case didn't go to trial because this really decided that Nebraska was going to have to find a way uh, to figure out a way to regulate groundwater. So then an unprecedented thing happens. The case after this ruling settles. Um, the states and the United States agree on a settlement. They agree on a stipulated groundwater model to measure the impact of pumping on the rivers. And they produce a five volume final settlement stipulation, uh, which the court approved in 2003. So that is the end of the first round of litigation. So what we have obviously is peace in our time. We have settlement, we have high-powered experts from the, the, from the United States and three states uh, putting this stuff together. Well, remember the final settlement stipulation? It's just like what Voltaire said about the Holy Roman Empire. It's neither holy, nor Roman, nor an empire. <laughs> okay, it's neither final, nor settlement, nor stipulation. In the first year, 2004, Nebraska blows through its allocations. It overpumps. Why? Because it makes more money by overpumping than it would by complying. It's the problem of efficient breach or opportunistic breach. It can afford to overpump and take the risk that a downstream state, Kansas in this case, will have to sue, the case will have to be accepted, and then they'll have to prevail. 
In this case, it was filed in 2010, it was accepted in 2011, and went to trial in 2012. Extremely fast, rocket docket with like liquid oxygen boosters. Um, and it was, it was held in Portland, Maine, of all places, that hotbed of aridity uh, in the, the uh, summer of 2012. Kansas saw damages, and I want to talk about how we tried to prove damages, to show that this is very interdisciplinary work. Those of you in the audience who are focused on dis interdisciplinary issues, this is a textbook case of that. In order to prove our damages, we used engineers and groundwater modelers to compute the amount uh, of Nebraska's non-compliance, about 35,000 acre feet a year. And then we used water resources engineers to take that shortfall and convert it to on-farm shortages and on-farm surpluses uh, in Nebraska. We used agronomists to take that on-farm shortage and produce a difference in crop yields for Kansas and Nebraska. And then we used agricultural economists to take that difference in crop yields and put a dollar figure on it. We used lawyers to tie this together to show that Nebraska's experts were, of course, incorrect. Um, and we even used mathematicians and historians in various stages of this litigation. Uh, I mentioned the trial. Uh, two of the more interesting things about the trial, and this, I think, brings us back to groundwater is that the manager of the biggest surface water irrigation district in the, in the basin in Nebraska testified on behalf of Kansas in this case because he saw that Nebraska's approach to pumping groundwater was more harmful to him than Kansas was. Kansas tried to get the federal government to be uh, more forthcoming about the reclamation projects in the basin, the United States played a very restrained and distant role in this litigation. Perhaps that's something that come up in Q&A. Uh, that we, there was no nudging here, Professor. There was no empowerment. There was, uh, let's hold back unless we absolutely have to. Um, the special master issued his report uh, in November of 2013. Makes for great reading uh, if you're interested. And it uh, found, uh, for Kansas, uh, the greatest uh, phrase in the report for me was that Nebraska had repeatedly engaged in reckless indifference. He said this from the bench while uh, cross-examining the counsel for Nebraska, and the Kansas lawyers were sitting back biting our cheeks, like, this is great, this is great, reckless indifference. Um, he awarded three to five million, uh, $3.8 million in damages and an additional $1.8 million in disgorgement of Nebraska's ill-gotten gains. This is the first time this has ever happened in an interstate lawsuit. If this survives, uh, the Supreme Court reviewing this decision, this would be a landmark case where the disgorgement as a remedy could offset these upstream advantages I described uh, earlier on. As for Nebraska, uh, it didn't get an injunction. It didn't get a river master like the one on the Klamath uh, that David uh, mentioned or one that occurred in Texas v. New Mexico. Um, it got a slight change in the compact accounting. That's a technical issue. And then the indifference is really the federal government. And I think it, it'll be interesting to see uh, where the federal government shows up in the briefing. We are currently producing exceptions brief to the court for this. And uh, so far, the United States, their briefs say the special master's decision should essentially be unchanged. So that's non-compliance. I want to wrap up talking about how you litigate compliance. Just a couple minutes. Um, recall these reservoirs in the basin. Recall that the states have different legal regimes for managing water. One of Colorado's options is to drain its reservoir. Bonnie Reservoir, and send the water down and thus not have evaporative losses. And evaporative losses can be very large. So that's a problem. You're draining reservoirs. If there were salmon in that picture, we'd have a very, very different, different problem here. The other path of compliance is called stream augmentation, where you take groundwater wells that pump from deep Ogallala supplies that are not connected 
to the river. You pump that out and you shunt it into a stream where through the miracle of Nebraska law becomes surface water. And then that goes into the reservoirs. This is called augmentation. It's a Colorado concept where you pump more water. Instead of reducing your water use, you pump even more water. So that's augmentation, even though it's actually subtraction. You turn groundwater into surface water. Um, this is why I'm putting up Mr. Orwell's picture. Is this some sort of return to where we started with Kansas v. Colorado, a return of the Herman Doctrine, where Colorado claimed it could use all of the water in, in its state uh, boundaries? Uh, I don't know. But I will say that, uh, in conclusion, gravity is more important than the equal footing doctrine. Isaac Newton could care less about what Justice Scalia says. Money is more important than gravity and water. That's the other rule. Uh, you see that with the Central Arizona Project, pumping water 400 miles and 3,000 feet upstream to take care of uh, irrigators and cities in Arizona. Uh, and I'll, I'll wrap up with my idea not necessarily one I advocate, but it's been out there. Should the Ogallala Aquifer be brought within the federal domain of some sort of uh, compact or some sort of agreement, the agreements, the post-comment agreements that David described? The numbers really are enormous. Uh, 276 million acre feet have been pulled out of the Ogallala since 1900. Every year more water is permanently removed from this aquifer. Uh, every two years uh, to a volume of the Colorado River. But the Colorado River is a renewable resource. Even with global warming, it's still going to flow. So we have national forests. Um, should we have a compact? Should we have a national aquifer? Um, I'll, I'll, should we have a William Villas uh, for uh, groundwater? I'll refer that to the special master and to the solicitor. Thank you. Well, do we have? Do people have questions? I know I have some, but I thought I'd turn it over to the sir. Well, two things. Uh, uh, the privatization of the river system is one of the things that President Nestle says that water is not a right and uh, can be privatized. And Tito Pickens is trying to corner uh, water and ship it all to Texas. Uh, uh, who has a right to privatize water? So the question, just for the for the recording, is is who has the right to privatize water and whether the water can be completely privatized? Yeah. So so I'll just you know quickly address that. In all of the states of the Western U.S., uh, you do have the authority to take what water you have a right to uh, and transfer that. Uh, so you could sell that water to somebody else. There are various limitations. Uh, and restrictions on how you can do that that make it difficult to do. So it's not as easy to market water as it is to uh, market petroleum or to market private land, uh, but we're seeing increasing uh, use of water markets throughout the West. It is most difficult in the case of interstate rivers, particularly interstate rivers uh, which have compacts because frequently the states really like to keep their own water. Uh, although even on the Colorado River, there have been examples now of uh, uh, the state of Arizona storing up groundwater and then um, uh, marketing that to users in other states. It's a good thing we're not in China. China doesn't recognize the rights of anybody downstream. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it is, I'll say, it's surprising, I think, to folks who aren't, uh, uh, don't have the... Uh, situation we're in where we have lived this water stuff, it's surprising that uh, private rights to water actually are very significant and, and are the backbone of, of the, our water system in the West. Um, and uh, they come in different sorts, uh, but they, uh, they're at least contra contractual rights, uh, if not statutory rights in most states. And that's a real constriction on um, the public decision about how water should be used. Um, you may have to buy out these water rights. Uh, so the, uh, the argument is there's a concern about the potential for privatization, 
arguably that's where we are right now, is with privatization of, of uh, most of our water. Nelson? Uh, why in any of these interstate disputes isn't there a market solution whereby one state pays the other for additional water? You want to take that first? Then I'll so the question is just whether these disputes can be resolved by one state buying out another. Well, there, the I, I think there, there are increasingly uh, market solutions, and the Colorado is a good example of, of where, essentially, California pays Arizona to store some of its uh, California's groundwater, uh, 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 California's water in. Uh, the groundwater basins in Arizona that are opened up by the Cal by the uh, uh, Central Arizona project. So, um, I mean, that's not that's that's more in terms of a cooperative agreement uh, to to stretch one's water supplies. Um, uh, intrastate, uh, there are here in California. There's a there is a very active water market, um, particularly around the Bay Delta. Um, but but Buzz, you're the you're the marketing expert. You should yeah. uh, expand. Yeah, I mean, I, I think your question's a really good one, uh, Nelson. And 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 let me give a specific example, but I'm going to make it hypothetical, so I don't get in any particular uh, case. There <laughs> there there are a lot of uh, water disputes between states that have ended up before the United States Supreme Court that actually involve a very small amount of water. Um, so there might be a lot of smoke around the, uh, the dispute, but we might be talking about, say, 10,000 acre feet of water in areas of the country where an acre foot of water might be worth about $10 an acre foot. And when you look at how much money the states spend on litigating these cases, you sometimes wonder why are they spending all this money litigating the case? rather than simply buying out the water from the other state or just paying the other state for the, uh, uh, for the water and saying, we're really sorry. I saw one slide, I think, at the end of, of Burke's presentation. I wanted to ask him. It looked like you were saying the litigation costs in your case has been $200 million. So no, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, the, the slide had to do with the amount of money uh, Nebraska has spent purchasing land and water rights uh, okay. to pump okay. Ogallala That's water right. into the stream. Okay. So okay. it's most of that water, that most of that money they could recover if they yeah. sold the land back. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, so I sometimes wonder why that doesn't occur. And I think it is because water is a highly emotional uh, issue and that it is about more than simply the value of the water. It is a notion that, damn it, this is our water. Water is precious in this area, and no one else is going to take it away from us without paying out of the nose and far more than the water is actually ever worth. I agree with David. I think there are opportunities to bring water markets into play on these interstate disputes not so much to buy off the other state, but in order to um, allow the water to be stretched further. Um, you know, you can, you can get people to pay somebody else to conserve water, which might free up some water for you. And I think there's some opportunity to do that. But it's very interesting to me how hard these states fight over what sometimes seems to everybody else to be only a little bit of water. Even in that case, if you're, and in some of these cases, it's only a couple of years that are actually at issue. But even if it is, say, 10,000 acre feet a year, um, you're generally in a lot of these areas going to be talking about water rights that might sell between, say, 60 and $80 an acre foot. Um, and so it's, it just still doesn't seem to, it, it, when you just look at the economics all by itself, a lot of these disputes don't make sense. And it's only when you realize how critical water is in the area and how seriously people take their water rights uh, that you can begin to understand. Let, let, if I can just give you one example that I think illustrates Buzz's point that this is not 
completely rational. Uh, within California, the Imperial Irrigation District gets its water for something like 15 or 20 bucks an acre foot. Uh, it can sell that water to the LA Basin for $400 an acre foot. That's what it did basically in a $2 billion deal under the 4.4 plan. Um, but there's so much backlash about that deal uh, that the entire uh, turnover of the Imperial Irrigation uh, District officers occurred. And Tony Perry did an article in the LA Times maybe two or three weeks ago where he interviewed a bunch of folks in the Imperial Irrigation District, uh, District and they said they'll never do that again. And there's litigation over the deal. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and again, just to emphasize, when David says there was a total turnover of the board, those board members were defeated in the next election. Right? I mean, there's no way they're going to get yeah. voted in again. So, uh, let, me, let me ask just a quick question here. Is there an example? So all these situations where there's conflict and crisis um, and uh, after the fact response to it, are there any examples of interstate water disputes where the states got ahead of the crisis, reached an agreement that resolved the disagreement uh, in a way that functions well? <laughs> <laughs> There are two compacts in Kansas that function very well. Uh, they're very sophisticated, modern compacts. They talk about water quality. One is the Big Blue River Basin Compact, and the other is the Lower Arkansas River uh, Compact between Kansas and Oklahoma. And the reason they function is because these are wetter parts of the world where you don't have water shortages. I think uh, it's really, uh, there are some workable compacts out there, but you know, perhaps the Delaware River uh, is an example. I'll let Buzz and, and David talk about that. But uh, you know, these western rivers where you have such evaporative loss, where the evaporative loss off of Lake Powell and Lake Mead combined can in years exceed Nevada's entire allocation of water. You know, it's a big problem. I guess the, the, the one other thing I would, would say in response to your question, and, and this plays off of David's theme earlier, is that water is really complex, particularly today, where you need to worry not only about the allocation of the water, and you have to worry about both surface water and the groundwater impacts, but you have to worry about endangered uh, species and environmental uh, issues. Uh, and we have a very fragmented water system where we've divided water up amongst the various states. We then divide authority between the states and the federal government. Uh, at the federal government level, you might have some of the fish which are regulated through the Department of the Interior, through uh, the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service, but other fish who are regulated through the Department of Commerce, through the National Marine Fisheries Service, and so I think one problem is simply on a lot of these river systems, you have to bring a lot of people together these days in order to actually resolve these issues. And when I earlier was suggesting that the federal government has to play a greater role, um, it was because the issues are so complex these days, unless the federal government comes in, the federal government has a lot of authority Unless the federal government comes in and plays a significant role, it's frequently very difficult for everybody to actually uh, reach an agreement. You know, but that said, that's true, but that said, the, the, the reality is that water rights are established on a state basis, yeah. basically. Uh, and and it is, it is a, it's a matter of religion, in, uh, particularly okay. in arid states, that states have primacy. Um, this is one of the reasons why, actually, the resolution of Indian water rights has been so difficult. Uh, but, but that the uh, on the other hand, that that sort of fits into the state system in that you 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 typically administer Indian water rights or or actuate them by focusing on the priority that Indians should have based on the the year that their reservation was established, which often is. The, the earliest water right, and that brings them to the front of the line. So you do it in the context of a state system, but parachute in. But but the feds, uh, uh, as uh, with somebody with a lot of war wounds, uh, <laughs> uh, suggesting the federal government is getting into states' uh, water rights pants. Uh, <laughs> uh, Buzz was correct at the outset that a couple of his ideas had had no political. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Just to get back to your question, though, because it's so complex, 
Um, I just think that you're not going to deal with the issues until it's just crisis. so much of a crisis that you have to. Um, you know, otherwise, you know, it just it, you look at it and you just throw up your hands. I will I say though, picture that, that Buzz had of the Colorado commissioners and just how cranky they look. Yeah, but, <laughs> but but you know, it, 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 to your question, uh, Leon, I, actually the Colorado River works pretty well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because no. you you have you have a more robust federal uh, presence, but you also have it leavened by the political reality that you got to get along with everybody because the states each have two senators and a yeah. bunch of congressmen yeah. and and uh, and and there's a shared recognition most of the states are in a similar position in terms of of not having enough water and being concerned about the future uh, it's 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 gotten into a pretty good rhythm of, of trying to solve problems well, that was actually one of my other questions is yeah. whether you thought it was there's been a lot of press recently about how we the Colorado River is now a a little bit of a model for interstate river management. Whether yes. you thought that was a fair yeah. characterization, uh, yes, yeah. and international, and it, now international and, and very, mm -hmm. very creative, very creative management, and, and a river that's looking at a very bleak future where the exactly. estimates are that uh, the the flows going forward will not be reliable because of climate change. Uh, may it, in fact, uh, future flows may diminish by as much as twenty percent over what we've been expecting, what we've been seeing over the last few years. Any other? Let's, let's look. Felicity? It's a very hypothetical question, but uh, I was talking to Pat Mulroy and Mr. Jones two or three years ago about, uh, about the Colorado River Compact, and, and she, she's now retired. She was head of the uh, Water Assistance and Stabilization Board. And what she ba I basically said, how have you changed the environment of that? And she said, It is now. <laughs> when, I start, well, she's out too. Uh, when I started out, I wanted to attack the compact because it was you know, Bobby Dyson put, uh, put there. But over time, I realized that was impossible. I don't know if she used the phrase war wounds, but you know, she realized that wasn't a useful way of going at it. So she said she just wanted to pile a lot of other stuff on top of the compact yeah. until it kind of it deflated became less important. So my question follows uh, that and follows Buzz's presentation. Is it likely, so there have been no new compacts for whatever we're going to have the next year or 10 years or something, is it likely that the existing compacts, maybe except for the Colorado, uh, but that the existing compacts will essentially become legally irrelevant because of the weight of events that happen after uh, potentially, uh, that's a strong statement, ir ir irrelevant, but I, I like the concept of law of the river, which is mm -hmm. the way folks talk about the Colorado River, because there is a Colorado River compact, but then there's the treaty with Mexico, there's the central uh, Arizona project after Arizona v. California, there are a whole series of layers on that are consistent with the architecture, So, uh, but, but that change the architecture. I think that's more likely, uh, and 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 I think it's 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 appropriate uh, because the issues change over time that that dominate. Uh, no one would have expected that uh, uh, storage, um, interstate storage, would be important. For example, yeah. and building on that, and on Leon's question, one success story out there I think where litigation has been averted uh, at the interstate level is on the the North Platte River, uh, Colorado, Wyoming, and Nebraska largely because of endangered species concerns on the plat with whooping cranes and pallid sturgeon and pipe plovers and some others, that uh, the Endangered Species Act, in this case, was the driver. They knew that that would create uh, greater reductions uh, if they didn't figure something out. So under the Platte River Recovery Implementation Program, P-R-R-I-P, -R -R they have a website, just Google it, it shows you how they're doing things like pulse flows for the sturgeon and other things. So I think that's a case where uh, you could argue the state's averted litigation uh, and built a law of the river on top of this decree, an operating system for this stretch of the plant. The other thing I would say is, is that one of the most valuable aspects of some of the compacts may be the commissions that they create. Uh, under which the states actually get together on a regular basis 
and both have to deal with the implementation of the compacts as well as other issues that come up. And I think one of the most valuable aspects of the compact histories might be these various commissions that have been created, which do serve as forums for the states, frequently with the federal government having a representative to sit down on a regular basis and try to deal with the issues that they have. And there was a study done about four or five years ago that showed that actually these commissions are uh, frequently pretty good uh, at being able to resolve the disputes that are brought before them. Maybe one more question, and then we'll finish up. So, um, one of the slides for the Colorado River has several numbers. You guys know more. But they were absolute numbers, not percentages. What happened to the global warming or just a bad year? Well, we see Mexico and that's all the top. That's usually the first yeah, answer. That's, yeah. the <laughs> that's the traditional <laughs> answer. <laughs> um, I, I think we'll see. Um, you know, the. The, the, uh, they're, they're, the, the states have agreed on shortage criteria um, uh, during droughts. Uh, whether that has to be converted into a new permanent allocation, I don't know. Uh, but uh, actually, until the last, what, six, seven years, there had been no agreement on shortage criteria that would guide the Secretary's determinations. Now there is. So it's, a, it's an illustration, I think, of, of what we're talking about, which is on the Colorado, at least, there is an anticipation um, of some of these problems, and they try to work it through. The, the reality is that, that the, the states are managing now for lower future allocations, um, uh, primarily due to climate change. Um, and, and, and the long drought, the Colorado's been in a drought for several years now. I guess the, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I think a lot of the compacts are relatively inflexible, and I think that's going to pose a problem uh, as we move into an era of, uh, of climate change. Yeah. I also think in, in many cases that, and this gets back, I guess, to Felicity's point, that in the long run, will a lot of these compacts become irrelevant? Um, in the Colorado River uh, situation, it's actually not part of the compact, but as part of the authorization of the Central Arizona project, California is supposed to get its water in the case of a severe drought before Arizona and yes. Nevada get their water. Yeah. Well, that's what the law says, but if we have a really severe situation um, and you have people in Phoenix and Las Vegas who aren't getting the water that, uh, that they need, uh, you know, I really wonder whether or not the politics will right. ultimately trump uh, these legal provisions. Uh, and so no one should feel particularly safe about their allocations. Is it really quick, Nusha? <laughs> <laughs> No, I don't think that. Well, they they were in the '90s, but as it, but again, the last several years have been dry, uh, and and actually, um, the Buzz's point is interesting because uh, it it was the concern by Arizona that that they would be left behind uh, in. Uh, uh, dry year that facilitated the parties reaching storage, w reaching drought criteria. Um, so it's a it's another example where um, unintended consequences sometimes can be useful, um, and the parties can recognize that because of inflexibility, they should try to get to the table and figure out something that makes sense. And Arizona has some things to offer with storage capability and that sort of thing. So. Interesting. Right. Let's thank our panelists some more time. Thank you all very much. And the big picture, though, don't the upper basin states.